while everybody's getting settled in. On the stage here with me today, we have Aladin Mogim, Special Cultural Zones Executive Program Manager at the Royal Commission for Al Ula, <laughs> Al Jahara Beydoun, founder of Ink Design Studio, Gate Awad, Senior Architect at Dar al Oman, and Taha Abdul Aziz Al Alandayani. I practiced this one. Senior Director, King Salman Project for Cuba Mosque Expansion and Area Development at Medina Region Development Authority. A whole lot. Thank you so much for, for taking the time to be here with us today and shining your light on this um, subject. I believe you've all been on my panel before, so it's actually really nice to, to get together again on this one. Full disclosure, I've prepared questions in advance. They were, they were shared with you. I'm going to just start somewhere and uh, shine your light on it, I would say, from, from your point of view. Uh, and I also feel comfortable if you guys want to continue the conversation and I'll take a back seat and, you know, pick you up and <laughs> stir you around when needed, right? Okay, let's just dive right in because we have 45 minutes. Towards the end, I will open it up to the audience for some questions. So uh, note them down or remember them. Here we go. They are for everyone. Is it possible to preserve cultural heritage while embracing modern design, or are we risking diluting tradition for the sake of contemporary trends? Of course. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, we're all a little bit distracted, right? Yes. But the party is over here, of course. Okay, of course. <laughs> go ahead. Um, it's, a, it's a very interesting question, and I do believe that uh, the... Uh, discussion around design and contemporary architecture is very important and how do we blend cultural heritage into it because the cultural heritage in what we do in Al Ula is uh, very important to preserve what we have uh, preserve what the ancient uh, civilizations had, had laid down for us in the ground so we work from the ground up we don't actually come in and impose new designs or impose new modern modernity into there uh, and take it for example the the Zaha Hadid uh, uh, bridge that she can actually in, in Abu Dhabi she she went in, into full modern design uh, but also she was very keen to put her style into it and actually put in the waves and the tradition that was in Abu Dhabi and many people actually don't uh, uh, see that in her designs, but actually it, it is there. It's, it's always interesting how we combine modern design with, uh, but I would actually shy away from modernity. I would actually put it more into the contemporary feel that we have uh, to put in forward into the design. So the contemporary design is really important to to put in the, the, the architectural motifs. I don't know if, uh, uh, Taha agrees because I, I see you have been working a lot in Medina in preserving uh, the heritage of, of Medina. This is quite interesting to see and unfortunately nowadays we see architects and designers who come in and putting all these motifs and designs without actually going back into the studies that takes place for those uh, architectural motifs that actually brings in uh, the value of the cultural heritage. After you. <laughs> well, it's, uh, I, I think it starts where we, we define cultural and heritage architecture because they were evolved. Keep it close. They were evolved, Aslan, from two main things we, I can see uh, the value they represent and aesthetics. So today, if you can actually respect both, why not add that contemporary touch to it? Or even modern, let's say high-tech, modern, contemporary. These are all new things to come, as, as long as we do respect the main aspects of the, the cultural architecture. Al Jahara, how is that? How do you see it? What's your take on this? Switch on. Yeah. Uh, the risk is always there to dilute uh, culture with uh, expression within any environment. Uh, it depends on who is applying it, for who, who's your audience, and uh, what kind of expressions are we making, and what kind of level of project are we talking about here. So it depends really on the specific project um, and how we are applying uh, the cultural interpretation 
uh, into it. So it depends, uh, and uh, again, what kind of lens are you looking at this uh, particular uh, perspective? How do you decide, you mentioned it, we built from the ground up, right? How do you side, decide which elements, context is relevant to drag with you into the future and which are the ones to leave behind or not focus on? I'm curious like how you, how you decide on these things. It's very sensitive. It's a very sensitive approach um, we take uh, in, in Al-Ula, especially in Al-Ula because we are a culturally sensitive place. And uh, how do we integrate both and what, what do we leave uh, behind is actually a very good question to ask uh, heritage, uh, heritage uh, experts mm -hmm. because we do engage heritage experts in our uh, process of design. Uh, we engage uh, um, subject matter experts uh, and we then define what should remain as old, uh, as history, and where do we move from there, from that history onwards. Um, do you feel like designers are, are cherry picking cultural elements for their aesthetic appeal um, without maybe fully understanding or respecting the the deeper um, significance? Unfortunately, that happens. Uh, sometimes uh, architects come in uh, with great designs. They just want to uh, take, for example, the Salmani architecture. Uh, but why is it unfortunate? I, I do agree that uh, you can cherry pick something, master it, and maybe even evolve it and uh, develop it further. It's OK, but like. Uh, without disrespecting it or its values and things. So I, there is a big chance of uh, <coughs> cherry picking. It depends on even your, your style, your motives and stuff. So yes, it happens a lot, especially like Roshan, everyone is doing it, but there, because there is a lot of space for creativity in it, you know? It's, uh, I do see it happening, but I don't see it unfortunate. Actually, I say it sometimes uh, like something yeah. an advantage. I guess it also makes a big difference who is actually cherry picking, right? Is a designer architect cherry picking because it serves their design intent, or is it someone who's put all the research in, distilled certain elements, and said, this is what you're going to run with, right? Actually, if you allow me here, uh, in Dar al Umran, we work on a lot of uh, culturally related projects. We look into the roots and deconstruct even the elements. We had the pleasure of working on many interesting guidelines here in Saudi Arabia, some of, uh, in the Eastern Province, some in Medina, some in Riyadh. And when we look at the traditional and heritage elements within those doors, how everything was sorted out in the past, we cannot neglect how it was made in the past. And therefore, when we start a new design, we do not cherry pick usually. Of course, sometimes it happens, but we have to understand what happened before we deconstruct it, we reframe it, and re-present it to what's contemporary at this stage. So I think sometimes cherry picking happens, of course, but if you put the right principles into and turn it into an input, this changes the entire game and how you pick your design elements and uh, improve it uh, and apply it on the design. I totally agree with him. <laughs> um, I think when it comes to uh, that sort of thing, most of what we see today is um, cultural appropriation and not cultural appreciation. So, and there's a fine line between the two. Um, and it's, the difference between the two is one is a skin deep and the other one is, goes that completely to the root of identity. So, um, there is, at some point people will run out of how many times they can create a Roshan and how many times they can create aesthetics of uh, surface deep uh, design interpretation. And then we have to look more deeper into what kind of values are we bringing from our culture to the surface. Do you think that it's realistic, feasible to truly balance that tradition with uh, modernity or, or is it always somehow compromised in favor of one of the other? Cultural, culture is not static. It's dynamic. It keeps evolving. It keeps moving. 
it's not just in the past, it's also in the future. And it depends on who's doing the actual work or the design. Um, and it depends if the person is from the outside, looking at the outside in, how deep do you actually think this person is able to go in versus someone from the inside going to the outside? How deep is he actually expressing? So um, to achieve the best result, I think uh, a, a sort of collaboration is always uh, beneficial for both parties because uh, personally, I get contacted by global offices, uh, for, especially for bidding projects, uh, for a tier, a, uh, tier 1 projects and Tier 2 projects. But they, they need someone on the inside who was born here, lived here, knows exactly all the unseen or unsaid things that they can't find online. Um, because as a culture, whether we are an Arab culture, Saudi culture, Islamic culture, when you see the design of our cities in the old times, it's always very private. And it was designed in a way for the outsider to get lost. So that's the whole point, is you need someone on the inside to lead you uh, through the ways of, of how we operate and how we function and how we represent ourselves. That's really interesting. Thank you for sharing that takes me to a question about research, right? Can you maybe all shine a light a little bit on how you conduct your research? Is it something that is mainly done in-house? Do you rely on external professionals? How much of it do you rely on engaging with locals, local community, people in the surrounding neighborhood of where you're actually building and developing? Anyone? Actually, it depends on the context of the task and the project. For example, when we uh, want to develop a new style or a new input in the design, in the architecture, for example, what we do is we look into both. We look into the desktop research, we gather all the data. Our luck is good because we have a lot of uh, uh, good uh, benchmarks here in Saudi Arabia. The second layer is visiting the sites itself, seeing the existing condition understanding what's happening there, and even looking into the narrative and the uh, cultural aspects, why people build it like that, how they used to live in it. So we do all the things in three parts, let's say, three levels of research. Desktop research, visiting the sites, and talking to people. And we would like, uh, we usually like to add a small flavor of analysis throughout sketches, throughout detailing, and looking into what makes it uh, happen as uh, a cultural element. This is very interesting. Um, from the client side, we do engage with global designers and global architects. And it's really important, the, the research that you're talking about. And good designers do that. Unfortunately, sometimes we do receive good designers on, on our team. But I'm take, talking from experience that I'm seeing uh, a trend where uh, global architects believe that uh, an architectural motif that is in Riyadh can be applicable in Jeddah or in Al-Ula or in somewhere else. And we do sense suddenly, we, we feel that these architectural motifs, it, it, it's not of the origin of the place. And then that's why when, when, when you ask the question about, and I said it's unfortunate that, that they cherry pick, because they do cherry pick from Riyadh, uh, the Salmani architecture, for example, and they apply it everywhere in Saudi Arabia. And this is not how Saudi Arabia it is. It, Saudi Arabia have 13 regions with 13 different uh, cultures, 13 different, uh, we call it the, the governance of, of Saudi Arabia. It's 13, and, and all, all these 13, if you, if you delve into each region, it can ex 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 explode into three or four different uh, categories of design elements. And, uh, I'm seeing that, unfortunately, when I'm working, I worked in Jeddah, I worked in Riyadh, and I worked in Al-Ula. As a client in all those cities and everywhere I'm there, they bring me something from a different place. And the education part where you mentioned uh, between the collaboration of the two, I think it's very important that the client and the designer work together in collaboration to achieve the design that is meant for that place, for that specific place. It's not about uh, bringing somewhere else. And your role 
yeah. is really important and because it, it, you actually do it the investigation. The minimal detail, for example, he wanted to use an image of uh, within the 3Ds of uh, you know a Saudi uh, man exactly. wearing. I said, this is a wrong image. You are, this guy is Emirati. It's not Saudi. Yeah. It's as simple as these small differences that makes a huge difference that they don't realize. We are we are completely different, not only within the region, uh, but also within Saudi itself. And each region is completely has its own uh, its own depth, its own uh, expressions, its own stories, its own narrative. It's not the same. Outside in, it's very difficult to understand. So there's a lot of nuances, right? Um, <laughs> must be very challenging. How does it play out in reality? Do you provide, as a, on the client side maybe, do you provide a certain framework, a certain blueprint, and you pass that on to the designer and then you tell them now you have certain amount of weeks to put your own sauce over it? Like, how does it play out in reality? Like, how do you start? We have, you let them free? For us, <laughs> we, no, for us, we have toolkits that we provide to designers. Huh. And these toolkits really help them understand. And we then do the indoctrinment of uh, the education of, uh, of what we have to, to all those designers. Uh, this is in, in Alola, but... Uh, no, this please. is great. Actually, a lot of initiatives happening in, in Saudi Arabia, starting from the King Salman Charter and even a different uh, governance like Alola Developing Authority, Medina Developing Authority. Today, Jidda is doing, Riyadh. Uh, everyone is doing their own, let's say, framework. Uh, they're giving them toolkits. They're giving them at least uh, an ignition where to start. The good thing today with, and you, mashallah, very good uh, number of years of experience today, also from the client side, we understand more and we have like more maturity of, of knowing what research is happening. So you will find maybe in the first, for first meeting or two, you'll understand how deep or superficial this research or this architect is, is going into this cultural thing. Because as I mentioned earlier, it's not only aesthetics and shapes and uh, forms, it's, it has a lot of core values in them that you need to understand and show that differentiation between similar cultures that are not only in Saudi Arabia, even in all the way to the Gulf, Middle East. We do have a lot of share uh, values that uh, like they do come up, uh, top from the from the religion and all the way down to the environment of the of the place I think they're going louder and louder so we'll go <laughs> I was hoping they would give up I'm really sorry guys <laughs> no, it's, 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 it's maybe we'll good. try to speak a little bit louder it's not in my hands I'm, yes. I'm, I'm sorry um, to follow up on on what you're what you're what you've started now and I only want to focus on Saudi Arabia. I don't even want to talk about globalization. Definitely. From an outside perspective, for someone who is like, someone like me, who's non-Saudi, comes here, how do we avoid that, for an outsider's perspective, things are going to look all the same or similar? Because you guys clearly see the nuances, but from an outsider. And we're focusing on tourism here and all these things. How do we make sure it's not perceived as all looking the same or similar. I think, and that's advice to everyone, uh, proceed with respect and intention to learn and to explore and to understand. I think that's, that's the first thing. Um, and not just uh, create a stereotype design or a stereotype understanding or concept development. No, it, it has to be approach with a bit of sensitivity uh, and a bit of value in regards to the respect element because to achieve authenticity you have to have a respect to, the, to whatever you're working with or dealing with. But Brandy, Brandy Jano always says design diplomacy and I really do agree with her most of the time about uh, the design diplomacy that she is talking about. However, our, our engagement with uh, with the community is really important. The community actually, if, if we go in and, and speak to the community, they will actually come in and tell us what, what, what should be done in the place. So we do engage in Al-Ula with local community and we do engage also with, we have created something called Madras Taddira, 
where it's a school of uh, the town, Madras Tadira. Madras Tadira concept is actually having the community design elements that is relevant from the place. So, in, so, so to create that authenticity that, that you're referring to, it, it's really important. So that collaboration between community and client and designers, I believe that's how we differentiate having nothing the same, having different flavors in everything. In your... I would like to add, sorry, for this point, because it's a very interesting point. It reminds me about the importance of cross-functional teams and the development when it happens, because we've worked in many successful projects that had a mature client who have a big understanding of the complex layers of design. So in order to avoid this duplication of style or duplication of a, a, sim, a symbol or a design element, the developer themselves or the people who are in charge, they are highly aware of the complexity between urban design, planning, architecture. In some cases, they even twist the entire morphology just to uh, avoid having uh, certain uh, conflicts. <laughs> We're just going to talk louder. Is it ethical or even possible for designers who don't belong to this culture to create authentic, respectful presentations, representations of that culture? As long as you do your research good and dig in deep all the way to the value, show respect. Uh, as uh, Johara mentioned, not only appropriation, but appreciation and translate it in the proper way to, to the audience, you're more than welcome. We're here also to support you and give you even empower you to do so. So because we do have a very rich cultural heritage, we have very rich cultures, as uh, it was mentioned earlier, different uh, areas with a lot and a lot today to, to represent and, and to show the world. So yes, we're, the more designers, the merrier, the better competition, the finer the products are. Good, good. I hear you. I mean, I guess we talked about talent in the uh, in the first panel of today. I think, and how it, how difficult it is sometimes to manage talent, right? I mean, we're building incredible things at rapid pace, so we're also dependent on bringing talent from all over the world here, right? So, I reckon maybe you feel the same or different. That it always goes hand in hand to partner a designer with a local. Um, expert to help them make better informed decisions. Correct. How do you? What's your What's your take on how do you go about when you know people from abroad maybe join your team or they work here on ground? Like how is that? How is that process? And how, also, how do you find these people? How do you choose them? Um, the way it happens is actually they find us. Um, and they collaborate with us. They see a sort of value that we bring to the table. And that goes into the level of detail of um, how to uh, express ourselves as a culture, as identity, um, as a design mind uh, in itself. So it depends on who we are dealing with. Uh, but peop for example, the people who have approached me is I appreciated that they put their egos on the side and they looked at the projects um, in a way that uh, they paid respect to the project enough to involve the locals into the deep understanding of the project. So it depends on, uh, on, on them, actually. It depends on how much of a good a product they want to make, how deep of a research they do want to get into. They'll go with, collaborate with academics, with practitioners who did a lot of work. Uh, ego, also, always with designers, there's an ego. So we need to, to be very careful on that, not disrespecting. So always ego, when it plays the bad role, it starts to disrespect any other information received. But um, uh, it, it's, it, it all goes back to that uh, firm or architect or designer. And they're starting to be well known. You'll understand their direction from the first interview, from the first like, like how deep they do want to go and present from their uh, the, the heritage or the cultural aspect. And of course, their profile will show a lot of that. 
Okay, yeah. Did you wanna did you wanna add to it? Yes, I agree 100 percent to this point, and it's very important to uh, from be- the beginning. The anyone who's coming from outside, it's important to put the ego aside. Really, for all the architects, it's a good. Uh, uh, it's good for all architects to put ego aside actually when it comes to heritage because at a certain point and a certain level of details you have to learn and accept what's uh, around you and listen carefully to the details in order to achieve good results. I also want to talk about innovation a little bit before we're going to also open this up to the audience. Let's just start with this question and see how where we get on the topic of innovation. How far can designers push innovation while still maintaining respect for the culture they are representing? And who gets to decide where that line is drawn? I would like to take initiative on this answer, sorry. Uh, we have here, as mentioned uh, by Engineer Taha, the Mithaq al-Malik Salman al-Umrani, uh, which is King Salman, uh, King Salman Charter. What I like about this initiative and this book, it, it allows you to understand principles, not details, principles. When you understand the importance of sustainability, the social context, and all these related matters, when you start innovating, you're already applying things that is helpful and impactful to the heritage and the context you're building in. Therefore, anything that relates to these principles will achieve eventually an uh, interesting results. This is my point of view. Like maybe also another point, innovation is a must today. It's not uh, a luxury. We need to be innovative because just mimicking will be staying in the past and copying, and that's not where we want to be. Today we have a lot of new building technologies. We have a lot of new uh, high-tech, uh, sustainable uh, materials. All these things need to be applied so that the new design sustains for the next hundreds of years like the, the old designs did. So it's it's all about time and this time we are needing innovation. And so it's a must, it's not just uh, like a luxury. And where do you then see the role of technology when we talk about preserving heritage, authenticity? I think building in this part of the world with these timelines, we're also heavily reliant on technology, how do we ensure that that we still keep the nuances, that we don't lose things, that not everything is run through, I don't know, mid-journey or, you know, that we get, that we're only focused on the eye candy, but how does technology plug into that, maybe maybe for you, maybe in your practice, maybe in your every, every day? No, actually, this is um, quite normal, uh, the technology that is used. For, take, for, take, for example, the National Museum of Qatar by John Novell. There is a lot of technology that has put into, into that project, the, the Desert Rose. But that Desert Rose actually, it represents the culture as well from, uh, from our world. So there is a, 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 a fine line between where do you stop in innovation and in technology to achieve what you want with, with, your, uh, with your project. This is actually a good question for architects, but also the limit. That the, that the client can provide to the, to the architects is very important because the client plays a big role in also assisting the, the designer into creating that kind of technology. But of course, we must be careful with, with budgets and uh, how do we, and sometimes architects want to, to go out of, of, uh, of that realm of budgets and, and exceed a little bit, but it's fine as long as there is a limit to where do we stop? But but for me, I would say there is no the sky is your limit in design. And you see more on the execution phase than in the research concept phase play out. So you see it like more as a tool to actually help build better, faster. Oh yeah, of course. Yeah. I think uh, this I wanted to add on that. Why a limit? Now this is where I want to come in, and we're playing a big role today with all the Vision 2030 projects that we're doing things today. Today, it's already limited. I'm looking 10 years ahead, 20 years ahead, and 50 years ahead, when that technology at that time is not something, a limit, it's already going to be obsolete. So why limit yourself today? It depends on the project. Definitely, the money is is a big issue, but sometimes when we give space for that technology, for that innovation, 
Um, I think this is where smarter uh, designers and developers do come in. A client is a ve- has a very big role in that, limiting and boxing some ideas just because it's safe. Innovation is usually not very safe because I don't know the, the result. But we are here today. We have the courage. We have all the resources to be very brave. And uh, I, I, I believe most of our projects today do demonstrate that. And um, I, I personally, we're working on some projects, although they are very cultural, heritage, religiously sensitive, but we are pushing uh, the innovation a, a little bit towards because we're not building for today. We're building something for, geni- geni- let's say, centuries to, to stay. And it's serving a very broad number of uh, people with very different uh, perspectives of what they want to, how, how they want to use their spaces. Aljahar, any, any thoughts on that from, you, from your end? Uh, for me, innovation is, is part of evolution. You cannot stop it. Um, we have to embrace it as long as it doesn't replace the human minds and the thinking uh, process uh, and the narrative we usually take things in. Um, it's to me, it's as it's, it's part of life. Uh, the hand, uh, the fork was once a hand. Innovation, part of evolution. It's it's part of human nature. But I think where it can be misused, uh, uh, that's where I think we have to be careful with. It's the 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 copyright of ideas, uh, the copy paste of because at the end of the day, AI is a collection of a human uh, resource. So it will become very difficult to trace the origins of ideas. But, and that's, that's, this is where the limitation should be controlled or supervised. Other than that, it's a great, it's, it's, it's a great tool at the end of the day. I always tell them the more innovative we are and, and courageous and brave, the smarter AI becomes. So, as Johara just mentioned, we feed AI, and they cre- it creates its knowledge from us. So, we innovative needs to be pushed more. This is maybe something I would like say to future architects: just do the proper research from that. Mm. Yeah, it shows us also how limited it actually is, right? Any, any actually, I th- I think AI is still limited in the part that relates to uh, architecture and cultural references, especially. We've done a lot of trials just to make it them uh, make it understand some of the vernacular elements in the design. It's very complex. That's why innovation. When we push our data, our information, our even uh, ability to write and express uh, properly to the machine, it will help us reach better results in the future, and it will give more accuracy to the uh, final product. Okay, cool. Let me open it up to the audience. I have uh, time for a question or two. So let's see what we get. Who wants to get? Yeah, okay, I'll, I'll get you the microphone. Thank you for the time. Hi. Uh, how do we balance the preservation of the Saudi Arabia cultural heritage um, with the push of the modern and innovative designs. How do we balance that? How to balance tradition with the modern and innovative designs? Where to strike that balance? Let's put it this way. Where do you draw the line for you? Where do you go, this is at the far end, or this becomes a cliche, or this is culturally appropriate, sensitive, elegant, delicate. Where's, where's the line for you? And the bad examples always come first, right? <laughs> this, this is a very good question. Very, very good question. Because uh, there is a thin line where do you actually, when you cross it, you are actually in the modern uh, realm. And uh, you have to be culturally sensitive when, when it comes to uh, the architectural motifs. Uh, the architectural details. This is where where you have a culturally sensitive project, not not a pastiche design that you just put in your building, but as you mentioned, is is once and for 
the f- f- uh, foremost is the research. The research is very important because how do you plan your building? That comes the, the cultural sensitivity into it. When you just dismiss and, and you take the, the plot limit and plot land and you just design something right there, this is you are, you're going modernism. But when you are actually taking what's next to you uh, in consideration, what is behind you of uh, cultural, uh, like for example, in the oasis in Al Ula, we are very culturally sensitive over there because we have to to locate where the uh, uh, the mud bricks and mud buildings that are, are are there and what is actually coming next to it, and, and then uh, each tree they have cultural significance to it, and then. It, you actually blend all those together, and then you 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 get your product. So it's it's there is a, f- a fine line between how do you get to modernism, and of course the styles of architects. Architects know where to stop uh, and where to to go beyond in that modern realm part. Allow me to add one additional point to answer this uh, interesting question. When it comes to hul- cultural heritage, it depends on the case. To be honest. Because sometimes you have such a valuable uh, monument that you want to preserve in a way, and you want to add or enhance the design and its surrounding. Let's take the Louvre, for example. Some can argue that the uh, pyramid shaped in the middle of the Louvre Square is minimal as much as possible. It's contemporary, it's steel, yet it does not uh, impact the surrounding heritage. Another example, I can say the Bujairi here in uh, Riyadh, which uh, which is an incredible development where you have a lot of good heritage references that you need to complement rather be against. So it depends on the case. Sometimes we have to go extreme, make sure that our implementation does not harm what is old and what we're seeing uh, that has a value. At the same time, when we see something that's worth complementing, worth continuing in terms of materials, uh, proportions, etc., it, 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 it depends on the case. This is uh, my answer. Do you want to go first? Uh- Now I say maybe until you start imposing, so your architectural character or motif will start imposing a different behavior or function to the client than what they want just to bring in that cultural element because we did not uh, get the, the proper value from it. It's like the small uh, triangular windows here in Riyadh when we had them before, But as uh, Johara mentioned earlier, because we were we wanted people to get lost at that. But what you're, you're going to be doing, if you put that on a commercial building where you want people to see you more and come in, and today we have all the means to, for environmental and even for privacy issues that can be solved with new and modern technologies and modern architecture, that's where you say, no, I've, I've trespassed. Uh, I got too much. I'm, I'm starting just... Just to say I'm cultural, I want to put that. But if you dig in more, and the deeper the research you get, so you'll have more um, value represented in your design, although it looks modern, um, that's where you need to go. So until you start touching the main function, I think you're safe. Thank you. I, I think it's an important thing that you also touch on the very pragmatic, the very functional element to it, right? Did you want to add to it as well, Jara? Or? Yeah, okay. Okay, cool. Thanks. Uh, I'll take one last question. All right, here we go. Uh, I wouldn't see where you were talking about the AI as the importance of uh, uh, advantage of it or disadvantages. So uh, let's go back uh, when we were, started, uh, we were designing and drawing by hand. And then after we went for softwares, So some of the engineers were like, no, we'll not go for softwares. We'll just keep in hand. We, we found ourselves in that. So my, my question is, uh, how much is the AI is risky for the, uh, the engineering? As you know, in, uh, for example, interior, a lot of clients now, they are going for AI and they're finding it very easy. So they are saying, okay, we will go for AI and less opportunities are there. So, uh, and how we, we must trigger the point to make use of it as one of words uh, I was delegate, uh, maybe 
in the future. The engineer with AI knowledge is for sure better with engineer without AI knowledge. Okay. Thank you. Very interesting question. Um, there will always be one Picasso, one Rembrandt, one Monet, uh, one Zahadid, one uh, Patrick Schumacher. No matter how many replicas of architects you create, there will always be the original one. So I am with completely using AI f as a tool to uh, cut, the sh cut the time in, in half and use it from that kind of um, software system, uh, but not to replace your mind as a designer and as a thinker, because that's the, that's, this is how we created AI. It didn't create itself. So it needs that kind of authentic uh, origin of a designer or, or, or a master um, to create. And for you to order, again, going back to the cultural question, also in use of AI, you have to master culture before you can break the codes of culture uh, in a way that is not politically incorrect. Anyone feels like adding? Uh, this is no? a topic that's going to open up a lot in using AI. Is, as you, me you mentioned, you had your answer in your question. If you didn't use AutoCAD at that time, you're not using BIM today, you're just back. Using an AI the proper way, as Johara mentioned, it's, it's the only way to survive. So it's, it's not something, okay, do you want to use it or not? If you're not going to use it, you'll end up being a good architect or a moderate or just a, a designer that has that enough knowledge. But whoever uses it properly will have leaps, uh, years ahead of research because it's just helping you to achieve more and better quality work. And it's, it goes back to you um, choosing from that information what's the proper one to get. That's what makes us human, right? They will exactly. always go hand in hand, right? Exactly. All right, um, I would like to end on that note. Beautiful conversation, very, very relevant, very important. Thank you so much. Thank you. And let's put our hands together for Al Jahara, for Taha, Gait, and Aladdin. Thank you so much for sharing Thank all you. that you know here with us today. Thank you.